All right. Hi, everybody. Welcome to another live stream from Montana Outdoor Science School. My name is Melanie. I am an instructor here at Moss. Um, Moss is a nonprofit organization that is responsible for getting kids excited about the outdoors and about science. We do this in a few ways with our school programs during the school year and also our summer camps throughout the summer. We are trying to get kids excited by showing them either science demonstrations or science experiments. We do games that are related to animals. We do all kinds of things. Last time I showed you one of those ways we have animals that are our, we call them animal ambassadors. And I showed you guys Rosie the corn snake. Today, what I'm going to be doing is I'm going to be doing a little bit of observation and discussion with you guys. It's something that we do with kids pretty regularly. It's something that we do while we're on field trips anytime. Today, I'm going to go on a little tour, a little walk around the Moss campus, kind of show you guys observed. Furthermore, our day today is all about beavers. Um, a little housekeeping before I get too far. This is only our second live feed. If I do have any troubles uh, technologically wise or with the showmanship, please be patient with me. We are always working through the kinks and trying to make things better. Furthermore, if you do have questions, would love to hear them from you. Would love to hear them in the comments. I'm only one today working. I'm on my own. Too far or I get carried away. Please be patient. I can always give you guys answers to questions after the live stream, especially if you put them in the comments after we share the live stream. So just wanted to let you guys know all those things and we did. So we are here outside of Moss. The building is next to a really great zone called the Riparian Zone. Um, the Riparian Zone is essentially a wetland. We have a little stream on the far end. We have some shallow, very still ponds down here. And this is not the best place to observe them. I will show you guys a better spot as we go about our little walk today. But is what I found just the other day as I myself was walking around. Beavers are bill, uh, dam builders. That's something that they are very well known for. They go through uh, to make huge dams sometimes, and it's actually quite important for an ecosystem. Beavers end up being called a uh, keystone species because of how their habitat building goes. So they will make a dam, and because the dam ends up slowing down the flow of water, slow area, very slow flowing area for other creatures that, to then inhabit. So it might be plants that start to grow up from it. It might be, it might be insects, all kinds of things start to uh, develop because of beaver's ability to make a habitat by building dams. Some of our little things we like to bring out for kids during moss is our artifacts that we have on hand. I have two pieces of wood that beavers have taken to chewing on. And I wanted to show you guys very specifically what it looks like when a beaver does chew. You can kind of see the angle at which a beaver chewed. It's not quite as sharp as a hatchet. It's not quite as sheer as a chainsaw. It's a little bit more angled than that. Um, and you can also see the telltale sign is that you get these striations, these little grooves in the wood. And these little grooves in the wood are the actual teeth from the beaver chewing its way. You can see it, this beaver chewed all around the wood pretty much except for this one last little spot. This is where the tree finally fell. This piece of wood, the biggest one I have right here, is pretty unique, or I'm sorry, not unique, it's pretty uh, indicative that it would have been used for the beaver's dam or making a, kind of a slow, slower area in the stream for slowing down water. Whereas this piece of wood I have, it's a little different. For those of you at home, you can kind of make your own observations before I say it out loud. But again, we see the striations of the teeth, those little grooves that the teeth make in the wood. This one did it on both ends. And I'm wondering if you guys can think as to between these two pieces of wood, other than the size, the biggest difference is that the bark has been removed on the smaller one, which tells us something about the behavior of the beaver. It tells us that the beaver chewed the bark off on this one, 
Reason being, beavers are herbivores. Beavers are responsible uh, for eating plants in their habitat. One of the things they like to eat off plants is the very, very soft inner lining of bark. So you can see on this one, there's no more bark left. These little dark spots uh, are kind of just little remnants left from a beaver, but otherwise all the bark has been taken off. Whereas on this one, you can see the bark is still there. It is not been eaten away by the beaver. Somebody has asked a question. They want to know, how does a beaver make a dam? That's a really great question. So beavers are really strategic about how they make a dam. It's not just a piling of stones and sticks. They actually are very thoughtful about how they do it. Sometimes they'll try to they'll angle that big tree to fall in such a way that it will slow the flow of water. Then they may even put some bigger sticks and they'll actually kind of face them up and down rather than horizontal. They'll put them vertical in the water if they can. And then they can actually start to place smaller sticks and bigger branches and such along those uh, vertical sticks to kind of make a bigger, uh, to kind of make the flow of water start to slow. I have an example of what a beaver has done here on Moss Campus. Wasn't any time recently, and I'll show you guys why. So I have found a log, a stump I should say, and it's a rather big stump that a beaver took out. This beaver probably saw this and it probably wasn't a food source. It was probably looking at this thinking, ah, this is gonna be a big enough branch, or I'm sorry, a big enough log for a dam. And the reason you can see, let's see, I hope you guys can see it too. Ah, yes, do you see these little striations here in the wood? This is indicative, meaning it's a good indicator that this is where the beaver was actually chewing. It chewed through the entire rim of the log until it fell. And honestly, it's hard to say when this occurred, but I can tell you it occurred a fairly while ago. On Moss Campus, we've never seen any uh, live sightings of beaver. Furthermore, there's a lot of lichen growth all on this uh, log here, which tells me that this probably happened a while ago. It's hard to say when. I'm not quite so good at observing, uh, being able to observe a timeline necessarily of that. But I took a little walk through the woods some more, and I started to find other logs in here that the beaver had taken down. So here's another example. The angle again is kind of upward, but not so steep as a hatchet or a chainsaw. Um, and let's see if I can get close enough so you guys can see the little striations in here from their teeth. This one's not quite as good, but there are a few little tiny grooves that you can see, two teeth marks that kind of rub past and break apart that wood there. And then I wanted to show you guys a really great example. This is a big piece of log right here. And on one end, there are grooves. Let's see, I could use some snow to kind of make it apparent. Yeah, do you see those grooves there? That's the teeth that a beaver had made. Um, and they did that all on this end. But then just the opposite side of this stump, it's very, very sheer. It's very, very cut off uh, in one slice. This is clearly what a chainsaw did. It may be that this entire thing came down from the beaver first and then maybe the fish tech center guys had to come in and sort of take care of a log that was in the way. We see a few other little tiny examples of the beaver. Let's see, can I get the striations? Yeah, there's a really good example, everybody. So there's two teeth marks right through the center, right through here of this beaver having come and chewed a very much smaller log, as you can see. This is probably something that was used, it could have been either dam building or it could have been food related, it's hard to say. But those are the little things that I found on my walk the other day as I was going around the Moss campus. This is something that I've never gotten to see before, especially come summer, and you can imagine why. I am trekking through all kinds of bushes, through uh, lots of leaves and branches and such, and in the summertime, it is so overgrown in here that it's kind of no wonder none of us have ever seen the remnants of those beaver logs there. Some of you might be wondering, well, how does the beaver go about chewing that? I mean, our teeth are nowhere nearly as strong 
for taking part a wood log like that. And it has everything to do with the teeth. So I have here a little example for you guys of beaver teeth. Let's see. Actually, I made a mistake. I have to apologize. This is not a perfect example of beaver teeth because this is my porcupine skull. I have a very, very different skull that is beaver. A few things that make me know it's not porcupine is the shape of it. It has a kind of a different arch right here under its eye. And it also doesn't have quite the same size as a beaver. However, this porcupine does much the same things that a beaver does. It does chew through wood to get the soft inner lining of bark, and therefore it has the same sorts of teeth as a beaver. All rodents have these very particular teeth. They're very orange. Oops, I'm sorry, everyone. They're very orange and they're very sharp. And the biggest thing to know is that rodent teeth are forever growing. Beavers are the largest rodents um, in the North America area. They have huge teeth. In this porcupine, you can see it's quite large already. If we looked at something like a squirrel or a mouse, we would see significant size difference, of course. And a beaver is even bigger than this porcupine I have here. Um, the teeth, I want to show you guys this bit because this is really fun. The teeth are forever growing and we can see, oh, let's see, we can see just how long they are within the skull. Oh, I don't want it to be fuzzy for you guys. So this is really the part that sticks out. Oh, almost there. There we go. This is the part that sticks out of the actual beaver skull. And the rest of this is what is growing inside. And so a beaver, like any other rodent, has to actually wear down its teeth to prevent the teeth from harming it. Um, if you've ever had a hamster, you may have experienced this, or a rabbit. Fun fact, rabbits are not actually rodents. They're part of a family called lagomorphs. They have slightly different incisors that don't have this orange enamel on them. So let's talk about the orange enamel. A lot of kids, they come to the uh, moss and they think, ah, oh, this rodent or this uh, rodent skull, the orange teeth, it must be dirty. It must be uh, not well taken care of. And the actual truth is that the orange is a very strong version of enamel. If y'all have ever taken a nail, like a steel nail, and let it rust, it turns red, of course, right? And the the uh, enamel in these teeth have iron, just like a nail does, and are going through the same process of uh, turning kind of an orange color. So that is a little bit about rodent teeth for you. Again, I'm sorry I don't have a beaver skull. However, porcupine skulls do function very, very similarly. They are eating very similar things. Few differences in the skull, particularly in size. This one is a little bit too small to be beaver. And also that shape again is not quite beaver shaped due to this little arch here that I'm pointing at with my fingers. So just know that this is not quite beaver, but it is a really good example of what rodent teeth are capable of. And beaver teeth are just the same. Let's continue our little walk around on the Moss Campus area. I wanna give y'all a really, really good show of the habitat that we have in the wetland area, that riparian zone. Let me face this this way, perfect. Something that people have often asked is do beavers hibernate in the winter? A really good time to talk about it right now since we are in a very snowy day and a very uncommonly cloudy day for the Gallatin Valley too. Beavers do not hibernate, actually. They uh, will store food. And what's neat is they actually use the pond that they live in to store their food, uh, much like we use our refrigerators, refrigerators to store our food. So in the case of beavers, they will take lots of little twigs. They'll take lots of that uh, bark, the fresh bark, if they can get it. They'll put it underwater. Because it's underwater, it's not being exposed to oxygen. Oxygen often makes things decompose quite a bit faster. Uh, much how if we expose a wet nail to oxygen, it will start to um, uh, turn rusty and the oxygen in the water will also turn a nail rusty. Same thing with any kind of thing that's decaying. If it's exposed to oxygen, it will start decaying faster. So because the beavers hide it under the water, not hide it, but they store it under the water, 
Furthermore, because it's cold, which is the biggest thing, it slows down that decaying process. So all winter long beavers have the ability to have their water still. And on this little piece of habitat, we can see just what has been created, at least in part by the beavers. Now it's hard to say when the beaver or beavers were around, it may have been quite a while ago. I have a suspicion that some of what has been made here is partly man-made because we do have a walkway between our pond. We have a walkway between our stream over here. And so it makes me think that perhaps people have built upon what the beaver, beavers already started. But this habitat, especially for students watching, if you've ever seen this place during the summertime, it is lush and it is green. There's all kinds of life going on. That some of you may recognize this log is a very famous log. Oftentimes instructors will stand here and they will uh, catch tadpoles and frogs for the kids to observe. This is a big habitat place for so many more animals than just a beaver. Like I said, the beaver might not be here anymore, but there are literally hundreds of other creatures that take to being here. We have the amphibian uh, example, of course. There's also lots and lots of insects. It's the kid's favorite thing to try and go uh, catch dragonflies or butterflies throughout here. We also see a lot of birds. In fact, there were a couple ducks I wanted to show you guys, but they're, I think, too far away to observe anymore. So we get bird life, we get insect life, we get amphibian life, and we get also plenty of plant life. You can see so many of these trees and these shrubs have taken to growing near the water. Um, where otherwise, if this were a dry landscape, it might look a bit more like a meadow or a field like so. So the fact that there is plenty of water is wonderful for um, all kinds of animal life. It's not just the beavers that need a habitat full of water. It's so many more creatures. And that kind of brings me to the next thing and sort of the last thing I want to talk to you guys about uh, regarding beavers. Beavers, for a long, long time, were a very, very desirable animal to trap for their fur. So hundreds of years ago in North America, a lot of European settlers were coming to the area. And at the time in Europe, during the 1700s especially, beavers were just about extinct or endangered or so low in population that trapping them was a very hard business in Europe. And you can imagine when people came to America, they realized there's literally millions upon millions of beavers here and it would provide an opportunity for them to find fur that they otherwise couldn't get in Europe. So beaver became a very desirable fur for a long time. I do have here a beaver pelt that was donated to moss, very especially. And I do want to also state that now beavers are no longer endangered. And there's a few reasons why. During that time that fur trapping was really, really uh, um, prolific, meaning really, really, um, what's the word? Uh, re really, um, oh man, I lost my word, that's okay. During the time that beavers were really, oops, well trapped, uh, people started to realize that their numbers were going down. People wanted the fur for all kinds of things. They wanted them for hats, they wanted them for gloves, for coats, all sorts of things were used for beaver fur. And that's not to say that that wasn't a bad thing, but the population of beavers went down significantly. People started to realize their habitat that was so crucial for other animals and even for people themselves was beginning to disappear. And what ended up happening was a lot of uh, things were set in place to keep beavers protected. So they were reintroduced to areas that had lost their beaver population. They were protected from being trapped and uh, hunted for their fur for a long time. They essentially protected the species long enough and strong enough to allow the population to grow again. And today, beavers are no longer endangered, but there was a small point in history, I shouldn't say small point, there was a significant point in history where beavers were potentially going to go endangered. But thanks to people being aware of it, being aware that they needed to sort of uh, moderate how they hunted beavers, it was able, the population was able to come back up, which was really, really uh, important for not just beaver populations but also for populations of other animals that use that same habitat that riparian zone that beavers are capable of making so with the beaver um it's kind of it's a really important species we see their significance not even just in animal life but in people's lives as well often beavers can help with uh 
Um, they can help with uh, kind of buffering flood zones. You can imagine if you have an area that floodwaters will come racing through, if there's a pond that they can hit that allows the level of the water to raise and kind of spread out throughout other wetlands, it sort of buffers and prevents a massive flooding from occurring. So people have been able to see that and they've actually been able to see that in uh, directly in Europe on the Great British Isle, the uh, Great Britain, I think, I want to say. I'm not sure about Ireland, but in Great Britain, beavers were extinct for a long time and they started reintroducing them there and it allowed for floods that uh, might have occurred otherwise to sort of be prevented from uh, wiping out human um, made areas from harming any kind of agriculture for livestock area. So we get to see in real time, even today, how helpful beavers can be. I also want to point out something about the beaver fur that's really unique. Beavers are a semi-aquatic animal, meaning that they are capable of living through the water, underwater uh, for a small time, but they must eventually come up, of course, for air, being mammals. But you can see there's kind of this longer, taller fur that's more orange on the top, and this is the guard hair on a beaver. This is essentially something that the beaver will take really good care of. It will uh, sort of make it a... Uh, it, uh, the oils off the beaver's skin will allow this to kind of wick away water. However, the thing that actually keeps the beaver warm underneath, you can see a really good example of it on the edges here, is this really, really fluffy down fur. This is the stuff that keeps that beaver warm. And if you see how thick it is, I like to joke, it's got a high thread count. Um, you can see how thick it is, and that is what keeps that beaver warm, even in the wintertime, underwater, even in that cold water, uh, all year round. So that is essentially a beaver for you. Again, this is sort of a little um, exercise in what we would do with students on any given day. We do all kinds of things here at Montana Outdoor Science School. We go through the process of showing kids, trying to get them excited about nature, trying to get them curious about how things work, how what things go on. Um, we are uh, thankful for you guys to be watching today. If you enjoyed this, and uh, please, if you enjoyed this, please uh, like us on Facebook. Please subscribe to our page. We would love to see more people tuning in for these live streams so that we can kind of get the word out there during the coronavirus pandemic. We want to be able to still inspire people, still get them excited about nature. Um, so please tune in next time. We will be doing this again Friday at 11 a.m. Thank you, everybody, and have a good rest of your day.